My name is Roman. I work on Caroteens in Kotlin Libraries team. And uh, so here's a question for you first. So who watched my introduction to Caroteens talk from the previous Kotlin Conf? Please raise your hand. Oh, great. That's almost how you. And who didn't I really recommend to watch it? It's on YouTube. You can do it. Uh, and here we'll talk about slightly different things. So first, we'll do a recap of what basics about Cartoon. If you watched all of my previous talk, uh, you saw you saw the message there. The message was Cartoons are like lightweight threads, and this message we send always or almost always when we teach Cartoons because uh, threads. Most of the people are familiar with threads. Cartoons for most of you are something new, and th this gets you simple mental model to work with. So when we say they're like lightweight threads, what do we mean? We gave you an example like that. Uh, so we show that creating a curtain is just like a thread. So in Kotlin, you can do thread and curly braces, or in curtains, you can launch a curtain and just like you start a thread. And when we say they're lightweight, we mean that we can have have hundreds of thousands of them without uh, problems, while 100,000 threads is something we cannot do. So however, that's a uh, quantitative difference. You know, Yeah, we can do more of them. And coroutines actually give us an example of things where when we a big change in quantity actually makes a qualitative change in the thing. So actually, it's not just their lightweight threads. And as I show in this talk, it actually lets you think and structure code in a completely different way, not just like you did it with threads before. So to do that, and this is the talk of calling it a practice, we'll take some practical challenge that we'll work on throughout uh, this talk. And um, assume you have a function to download some content. We, we know location, and it gets a content. And that's something you can relate to in any project. Like Whatever you do, you usually work uh, with some outside system services, and you retrieve something from there. So replace in your mind this downloading content with anything else you might have in your application. It does not matter. And it's marked with suspend modifier. Um, I hope you know that. It means it's asynchronous. Uh, it doesn't block. An invoker just waits uh, for the response without blocking. And our challenge is this. Uh, we have lots of references to those resources, and we need to write a process that takes those references, you know, loops for all of them, then resolves them to the locations, and then goes and downloads the contest, contents of at this, that location to process them later. That's the thing we want to do. It looks OK. Uh, and Again, you might already know that if you write a code like that, uh, you'll get an error. You know, and the ID will uh, actually invite you to add suspend modifier to your process references function, meaning okay, this function is also long running. It will wait until all the contents are downloaded. But the trick with this code is that it's actually sequential. So we wrote some code, and the code in suspending function performs sequential thinking. It will download contents one by one, one by one. And if that's not really fast, uh, that can take quite a lot of time. But hey, we have coroutines, so we can uh, do it in parallel. How we do it in parallel? We just say launch. you know, uh, And then in the loop, instead of just waiting for uh, each content to download, we just say, let's just launch coroutines to download it. Seems OK. You know, curtains are cheap. What could go wrong here? You know, it's not like threads. Of course, if we just started lots of threads, we know what could go wrong. We run out of resources. But we've been telling you all the time, they're cheap. So what can go wrong? To understand what's going wrong, let's take a close look at this loop. So how it works. We take first reference. We resolve it to first location. Launch, download from the content of this location. We take second reference. We resolve it to second location, launch it download. We take third one. And then what happens if result crashes? Some bug, you know, wrong reference, something not found. It's a crash. Throws exceptions. You know, 
the, the whole process references aboard. Now all the curtains will be launched. They are still there. They're working, doing their thing. They, they have leaked from our procedure. Now what we usually, in the kind of reliable code that we might have, we have somewhere at the top, we catch this exception, we, we try this process reference. It happens again, we leak more. And you know, this way, even though coroutines are cheap, you know, we may have unlimited number of those leaked coroutines running in the background. We'll ultimately end up out of resources. We'll overload downstream services. It's not good. You know, leaks are something that we don't want. So what do we do? The answer to this is called structured concurrency. So instead of working with coroutines like we do with threads, just launch them whenever we need to do something in parallels, we do it in a structured way. What does it mean? It means that instead of writing these process references as a function that just launches coroutines like all threads, we turn it into a suspending function again. We say, okay, we don't want it to complete until everything is done. We want it to work in a structured way. We want it to start doing its thing and only return uh, after all is done, but do it in non blocking way. That's why suspend. And then we use a function called curtain scope. Curtain scope delimits this kind of parallel work that does something and has to wait for its result. Now, inside, we just put our code inside the curtain scope. But instead of using global scope.launch that we had to use before, we just say launch. And that does the magic trick for us. Now this launch becomes a child of the scope. It is bound to the scope instead of just being run globally like we usually do with threads. So that's completely unlike threads. We now have a child coding. So this is a concept we don't have in threads. And how it helps us? It helps in this way. Now if this piece of code crashes, this exception goes through the scope. And the scope goes and cancels all the children quarantines that it had already launched. So this way, there's no leak. They're all canceled. And not just they canceled. Actually, the scope would not return until they all complete. So it not just cancels them. It lets them finish whatever they were doing, close the resources, execute their final sections, do cleanup. And only then it returns. So when our process reference function returns, it's we have a clean state again. Now we can safely retry it. We know that it had not leaked a single carotene, had not leaked a single job. Now our next topic is about the state. We often have processes that involve state. I mean, there is lots of them, so let's take an example and work with it. So for an example, let's assume that instead of just downloading stuff, taking references and downloading their contents, we want to create a long running process, some kind of a downloader process that does these downloads continuously. And as an additional feature request that we have, if it so happens that multiple references map to the same location, resolve to the same location, uh, we don't want to download it twice. We want to download just once, and uh, you know, save on the request to whatever backend service that we're using. So let's try to implement it. If we were programming with threads, our intention would be to encapsulate this state that we now have, because we now have a state. We now have to keep track of what locations we are downloading. Right? It's not just a simple function anymore. It's, it's, there's a process with state. So in object-oriented programming and threads, programming with threads, we're told that let's write a class. Right? We usually encapsulate thread in a class. So let's create a downloader class. And then it has a state. We'll make a private state in this class. It is going to contain a set of locations uh, that are being downloaded. And then when we, this class is asked to download a reference, it's going to resolve location of this reference. And then, see, if it's the first time we're somebody requesting this location, if it's not yet in uh, the set of locations, then we go schedule download. And otherwise, uh, you know, if it was already downloaded, we just wait for results somehow and process content. 
Now, this, this the code we would have written. I mean, I'm not feeling it's completely for a purpose. It's just a skeleton of something we would have been written if we were programming with threads. But now, see what's happening here is, in some sense, coroutines are still like threads, and they still involve concurrency. So when we have multiple coroutines, it's similar to, to having multiple threads. We have concurrency. We have things happening concurrently. So if we have a complex application, then multiple coroutines can invoke, call this download reference concurrently with all the other coroutines. You know, it's a long-running process being used actively inside our application. And see, inside of it, uh, we work with this requested set. We add to it. And this also now happens concurrently. So now we have this state, even though it's private, to this downloader class. Now it's shared in shared between multiple coroutines. So multiple coroutines can touch this state. And I hope you all know, and uh, you can relate uh, to the slide that was shown at the keynote, that you know, when you have shared and mutable state, that really ends badly. You know, it's uh, something you, I mean, you can do it if you really know what's doing, but the problem is that if you forgot something, you forgot a proper synchronization, forgot proper locks, the, then you have a box that's really hard to track down. You know, it's data races, you could make work normally in your QA, uh, but then fail in production, you get weird crash locks uh, from your customers. It's also a problem happen when you start sharing mutable state. And in this case, coroutines, uh, there's something on the surface no different than with threads. When we program with threads, we have to remember about shareable, mutable state. And we, when we program with coroutines, uh, we have to remember about shared mutable states. That is dangerous. Don't do that. But you see, with threads, we don't have much choice. When we program with threads, that's all we can do in the problem like that is to have this shared mutable state, to have to write synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. But coroutines, they do give us a choice. With coroutines, we don't have to have shared mutable state. And that's the change of the way we program with coroutines. So instead of shared mutable state, we can share information in our code by communicating between coroutines. And the coroutines gives us, as we'll see, this power. Instead of working with synchronization primitives that we have to use with threads, we can use communication primitives. And instead of writing classes to encapsulate our state, we can just write coroutines to encapsulate our states. We, we don't have to do it the way we did it before. Though we can, but we don't have to. So how do we do it? So instead of writing a class, let's just launch a coroutine and have this mutable state be part of this coroutine. Let's declare it inside the coroutine. You see, this way, since it's confined to this coroutine, it's not shared. It sits inside this coroutine. You can access it from outside. It's only this coroutine that can touch the state. And then when we, this coroutine adds something to the set, it's its own set. It's not shared with any other coroutine, so it's safe. But now we have a problem. We somehow have to know a list of references to work on. Now, and remember, we wanted to have a long-running process that just sits in the background process as references. So we have to somehow tell this coroutine, you know, this is a reference you should be working on. So what do we use? Uh, again, in threads, we've used a synchronization primitive. We would have made this process resources function that's synchronized, that's synchronization primitive. And in for when we program with coroutines, we can use a communication primitive for that, and that communication primitive is called a channel. So a channel is, lets us transfer information from outside world to inside our coroutine without worrying about sharing mutable state. A channel is like a simple pipe. You send on one side, receive on the other. Let's see how it's used. So to work with this channel, we have to get a reference to this channel from somewhere. So we declare our downloader, instead of declaring it as a class, we write a function. We say, let's write a function that creates a downloader. And this function 
is going to take a channel set parameter because this particular coroutine is going to be receiving from this channel. It's a receive channel, a channel we can receive from. So the references is a receive channel. That's a parameter to our coroutine. And inside, the function is implemented through launch, so it launches a coroutine. And we have this convention that whenever a function uh, launches a new coroutine, we declare it an extension of coroutine scope. It's a it's really nice convention that makes our code self-documenting. So now when I see, look at this function, I don't even have to read documentation, I look at the body. This convention we use that whenever a function is defined as an extension on coroutine scope, that means this function is going to launch a new a synchronous process. That's convention we use. Very convenient because uh, launch is defined also as an extension of coroutine scope, so we can just use it from inside. So it will launch a coroutine in whatever outside scope uh, this function is called from. Now we just put our code inside. And inside of the code, channel works like a sequence of elements. We can just use a for loop to get references from uh, that are being sent to this coroutine and write whatever code we want. So we can take reference resolve location. Uh, we can add it to our uh, set of uh, requests. And if it's the first time, then we somehow have to schedule the download. And we don't want to do download right here, because if we download it here, we lose parallelism. Remember, we want it to download in parallel. So how we do it? How we schedule this parallel download? Now, we have coroutines, right? So we can launch a coroutine to download. That's OK. So we launch a new coroutine to download. You know, coroutines are cheap. What could go wrong here? Uh, you might be thinking, oh, you already told us what could go wrong, right? Uh, we already looked at the previous example where we launch new coroutine for overthinking. We just lose them in case of exception. But not here. Here we have our basis covered, because launch also defines the scope for coroutine. So whenever we launch from inside of it, that's becoming a child, and it works nicely. So if that thing crashes, it also cancels all the downloads it had launched. So no, it's not the problem with leaking coroutines. It's something else. So let's think what else it can be, what other problem we can have. Uh, and to understand the problem, we shouldn't be looking at the launch itself. We should look at what the launch does. You see, coroutines may be cheap, but it doesn't mean that the work they do is cheap. Like in this, inside this launch, we'll be doing some download process that creates network connection, uh, accesses some backend system, and that's all resources. And you know, there's limited amount of those resources. We can uh, create. I, I we really can afford to create hundreds of thousands of connections. Uh, and even if we can in our system, we might overload downstream systems that are responding to these connections. So whenever we do something concurrently, and it happens always, whenever we start doing something concurrently, we have to limit concurrency. I mean, you should never be doing like unlimited concurrency. Let's do things like concurrently. Because without limits, that usually causes problems either in your code or in downstream systems that you work with. So we have to figure a way of limiting concurrency of the things we do. So how we do it? The way we do it is have a name, and the name for this pattern is called workable. So instead of just launching unlimited number of curtains that would do downloads, let's have a limited number of them, a number that we control, not, the, not just random number, but some configuration parameter, how much concurrency we want in our code. So let's create those coroutines that's going to perform the actual downloading work. And uh, now when references come in to the downloaders through the channel, we'll use another channel to send the location that needs to be downloaded to this work airport. So let's implement it. Now we see the downloader coroutine. It used to have only one parameter, just references channel. Now it has the second one, locations. So we add it in as an additional parameter to our function. Now, in addition to references, we have location. But because now the downloader is, it was receiving, receiving from references, but it sends locations. So locations is a send channel. It's the channel we send to, we send locations to. Now, 
how changes the code. Now, the code inside the downloader is straightforward. When it's the first time we see this location, we just send it over location channels to our worker pool. Great. Now we need to set up this worker pool somehow. So let's use the same pattern. Let's define a function. Let's use the same convention. Let's do an extension on Caroline scope. And because the worker receives locations, we define a parameter as receive channel. So that's location that it's receiver locations from. Now let's write its code. It's also a carotin, so we just launch a carotin here nicely. And we use loop for locations. And uh, you see the trick is here is called fanning out. Remember that we wanted multiple workers. And you might think, oh my god, I'm now, there's multiple workers now uh, looping over this channel. But the fact is channels are specifically designed for this custom part. And whenever you use a for loop to work a channel, it works is fan out fashion, means each worker receives just one request. Or in other words, uh, re each request gets received by a single worker. So it automatically distributes the work worker. Well, channels are, again, channels are specifically designed for this kind of usage, the work in fan out fashion. So now inside the worker, the code is really simple. The worker can, can just invoke our suspending function to download the content from this location and process it. But now, here's the problem. We don't know what reference it was. We only told our worker what location to download. It doesn't know what reference because the other cartoon had been resolving uh, the references to locations. Moreover, we wanted to optimize the thing. So if multiple references result to the same location, we just want to download once and then process the result as if we did it multiple times. So what do we do? How we finish our code so it actually uh, works and the code is not read? So let's take a look at our architecture. What is the piece in this architecture that actually knows about mapping between references and locations. It's this, it's the downloader. It's this coding that actually resolves references to locations and knows what it's doing. So let's, we should deliver the results back to the downloader so, because it knows what references it was. How do we deliver that? You know the drill. There are channels for that, right? So, but what do we send? We send something in Kotlin. Uh, we create a data class for that, right? So we have a data class with location and content. And now, in our worker, we just say, OK, please send your results uh, here. Here is the same channel you would use to send locations and content you've downloaded. So now the worker code can be finished. Uh, it's not ready anymore. It compiles. You know, it just sends the locations and content. It, had downloaded to this channel. So now a picture looks like this. Downloader sends locations to worker pool. Workers we reply back with contents over another channel. So now we see downloader now has three errors going in and out. So it has two channels in, one channel out. We have to modify <coughs> the function correspondingly, right? We add third parameter, that's contents. That's this downloader is going to be receiving, so that's receive channel. Now let's finish its code. Inside, we're looping over references. But hmm, now we have two channels to receive from, right? So now downloader can receive references over one channel, or it can receive contents from another channel. So how do we actually write that? Uh, we, we can't loop just for references. Uh, if we were programming with threads, you know, we'd say, OK, OK, we'll just have two threads or two car routines. You know, one reads references channel, another reads uh, contents channel. But then we're back to square one. Now this mutable set of requested variable has to be shared between two car routines. And we're back to the hell of shared mutable state. We don't want to be thinking about shareable mutable state. We want to structure our application that we don't need any shareable mutable state. And for that, we have a select expression. So select expression is this trick that allows us to structure our code that works with multiple channels without using shared mutable state. So the way it works like this. We write select, and we put a number of clauses inside. And we can say if 
something is received over references channel, do this. And if something is received over contents channel, do this. And since select is an expression, and in this particular example, we don't need any result from it. We say that result is going to be unit means it's like with unit return function. We don't want any result from this particular select expression. So now, what happens with our downloader code? Uh, we update the state a little bit because we, we don't just need a set of locations where they're loading. We also have, have to be, keep track of what references uh, do want uh, triggered the download of this location. So we say we keep a map of locations to a reference. Now, inside, we just loop forever because that's what our downloader is going to do. It's going to be a long running process. It just loops forever. And then it, it uses a select. And we write a code. If something, if a reference request is received, then what do we do? We resolve the location. We see if we all do request in it, what's references we've been, been recorded so far. And if it was not, then we send it to our worker pool. We say, here is a new location to download, start it. And otherwise, we just record that, oh, here is a location where all the downloading, so we just record another reference for it. So we have this non-trivial piece of code. The logic is pretty non-trivial that works with this mutable state, this mutable map of requested locations. And the beauty of it that inside this code, there's no concurrency. So we don't have to worry, shall I use concurrent hash map? What happens if I first check and then act? You know, we don't have any of those problems because Everything inside the coding happens sequentially. So no concurrency, no need for synchronization. We just write simple sequential logic of it. It's easy to verify that it's correct. There is, we don't have to stretch our mind to see why it would work or why it wouldn't fail. So now all we have to finish is the other clause. So what happens if uh, we receive the results from the worker pool? And worker workers send us location and the content. It's easy because this code knows this map. It can loop for all the references recorded in the master and pro process the results for these references. So that's kind of completes the code of downloader. It's all sequential, no synchronization needed. Easy to check that it works. Now let's put it all together. So we wrote these pieces, but they're now separate functions. So how we actually put those separate functions into something we can uh, easily use. Let's take a look. That's our architecture. In this architecture, we should jump with just one input channel. That's references that uh, somebody, some other parts of our systems request, and there is some internal structure inside. So that's our input. So let's write a function to encapsulate all of that. Okay. This function starts some uh, coroutines. So again, convention defined as an extension of coroutine scope. It only has one input, the receive channel of references it's receiving from. And inside, it just creates the other channels it needs. It creates a channel for communications between worker and downloader. And it just creates workers and creates downloader. That's it. We've encapsulated this whole setup into a single function. Now, from outside world, uh, we kind of hidden the whole detail of this machinery in this nice process reference function. It's encapsulated. All we have to know from outside, all the internal functions can be private now. Like the only public functions, function we need is this process references that sets up all this infrastructure to do the actual concurrency limited downloading. Now, when we look at this picture and when we actually start to apply the thinking throughout our systems, we'll start to notice partners everywhere. We'll see the same constructs repeat ever and ever again. So we see worker pool. That's a partner. We often need it uh, to, uh, to work with limited concurrency tasks. We see the object that encapsulates states and receives messages. That's partner called an actor. And these partners, because Kotlin as a language has uh, really nice abstraction facilities, they're easy to abstract into functions that are ready to use. So instead of manually writing, so I kind of show you low-level way, how we construct those partners from pieces. 
But many of those processes can be abstracted away. For example, we have in Kotlin library an actor abstracted nicely away. And w we don't have work here pull yet, but we'll be adding it later. And there is actually many other patterns that exist and that appear recurrently in the systems, but that's the topic of whole another talk. I mean, that's maybe a talk I'll be doing on next Kotlin conference, you know, what kind of patterns are there, how you use them. Here, what I wanted to tell you that when you start thinking differently about the code, when you structure it in a way that you don't share, you know, you, your code start look different than the code you would have written with threads. That's the main message here. So let's take a look at the current scope for now. So we started with structured concurrence, and then let's look at it again. So our whole process reference function is an extension of current scope. But where does it start from? Well, let's look at our application at large. What's the first scope we should be using? Where it appears? Like what be the root scope in which every, everything works. So where does it come from? How we structure applications so it's properly, we never lose coroutines. And to answer this question, let's uh, take a look at how we usually write applications. In our applications, in real applications, long running applications, either it's backend or frontends, we usually some, have some classes with a life cycle. Uh, if we're using MVP, for example, pattern for our UI application, that's usually, that's usually presenter classes. We create them, we destroy them. In an MVM uh, architecture, that, that would be our uh, view model classes. Uh, it, on backend uh, systems, we have connections, we have request classes. All of them have lifetime. And while they leave, they may need coroutines to help them doing the work. And we, want, we usually want to be sure when the lifetime of these things end, they don't forget, don't leak any coroutines, don't leave any coroutines behind. So this is enforced by just implementing coroutine scope interface by those classes. This is a mark that the thing is going to, to be a scope for new coroutines, is going to control when they are destroyed. How we implement it? Coroutine scope is actually a trivial interface. All we have to do is implement one property to give a context for all the coroutines we start. The way we implement it is this. We create a job object. The job object is, is a life cycle of a coroutine. So whenever we say coroutine life cycle or life cycle, that's, that's called in a job in the coroutine library. And actually, the, the very first prototype of the coroutine library we used the name lifetime for the job. So in the very first prototype, this, this interface was called lifetime. But then we played with it, didn't really like the lifetime. It, didn't, it Sometimes it looked well, like in this example, but it, sometimes it didn't, so we named it to job. And now it's in the version that we're about finalizing 1.0 with the Kotlin 1.3. It is going to be, uh, fi its final name is going to be job. So we create a job to represent the lifetime of all the coroutines we create. Now, because the class we're writing it in has a life cycle, it means it can be disposed or maybe closed. It doesn't matter how this thing called, I mean, it can end, you know, it has an end to its life. So if detach, dispose, close, like different frameworks called it, it doesn't matter. In coroutines, this is called cancel. So when the thing is disposed, we cancel the job. That's for coroutines, canceling it means the end of its lifetime. And now, all we have to do in our current context implementation is say, okay, we want all new coroutines to be launched in the context of this job. And that guarantees that whenever the life hive terminates, uh, it also cancels all the jobs that it had launched so far. What's nice thing about this is that you can do other convenient things here. For example, we can add a default dispatcher here. So we know the thing is running as a part of UI, and it, it's, it's actively interacting with UI. We want all our coroutines to be bound to our main thread. So we just specify it right here. So just one place, we put it, and then we don't have to always remember, oh, I should not forget to launch my coroutines in UI thread. Just one place, we encapsulate all our defaults for all our coroutines in just one place. And we can add other elements we might need. So now, if inside this class with life cycle, I have a function that does something, and it needs to launch new coroutines, it just works. Because now my class implements coroutines, once I just launch it, 
launches extension on Carlton's scope, it just works properly. Or I can use my own functions that I defined that are defined as extensions on Carotin scope. That's why a convention, that's when a function launches new Carotin, we define an extension on a Carotin scope. That way, we, when we use it from inside our uh, lifecycle classes, classes with lifecycle, they work properly. They work in the context of the appropriate job. And this way, we never leak any Carotin. That's why we would destroy our form, our view, shut down our application, all the Whatever background activities they were launched will get canceled. And that's something new. That's something you don't get with threads. That's, that's the way how coroutines are fundamentally different from threads, in the way you structure your code. And you do it in a structured way. So the, there is uh, lots of confusion. Uh, and I've, I've met it multiple times on forums, uh, people asking, like, uh, how is this coroutine scope now relates to suspend function? So I can do suspend function, I can do extension coroutine scope. Uh, what's the difference? What, what should I do? So let me give you, like, really short, brief rule of thumb. What to do what? When you write a suspend function, it means that it does something and waits for its completion without blocking. That's a suspended function. It's, everything it does is contained in its lifetime. So I invoke it, and it does not return until it's done ending, done doing whatever it was doing. That's suspended function. And suspended means it's not blocking. So I can use it from UI thread, and my UI is not going to freeze. When I define a function, as an extension of coroutine scope, it means it launches new coroutine and returns immediately. That's, again, a convention. So, I mean, you can do something new, but convention is that it doesn't wait for them, it returns. But in this scope that's its extension on, it had created some new background coroutines that now work in this scope that's its extension on. And to avoid confusion, I never define functions that are both suspend and extension of coroutine scope. That's easy. I mean, it's, it just makes code easier to understand. It's either a suspending function that waits, or it's non-suspending function, that extension on coroutine scope that does not wait, just you know, returns quickly, launches something. And that's it. So as soon as you keep to this style, there's no confusion. And you also have this, in the beginning, we saw this coroutine scope curly braces, that works like a bridge between the two. So in suspending function, I can use coroutine scope and launch a bunch of coroutines inside. And my coroutine won't complete until they're all complete, because suspending function only finish when all they were doing completes. That's the rule. Should not, suspending function should not, by convention, leave anything behind. They should, when they return, they've done doing whatever they were doing. So what's the takeaway? So we've started with the, this idea that coroutines are like like with threads. And it's, again, easy mental model for people who are familiar with threads. But in fact, you know, coroutines are not like threads. That's where quantity leads to completely new quality. That they're qualitatively different concept that lets you structure in a code in a completely different way. So you sh when you're using coroutines, you should rethink the way you structure code. You see, because you have so many coroutines, like in threads, you have few of them, and you have no choice but use shared mutable state. And because there are few threads, you can keep them in your head, you can figure out who touches what. But coroutines are lightweight. Your, your applications, when you start using them, might have thousands, tens of thousands of coroutines. If you do sh shared mutable state with coroutines, you'll just get lost. You know, there's no way you can track it. So we think the way you structure code, avoid shareable immutable state, and uh, embrace the structured concurrency. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Uh, we have mice here. So I mean, if you have any questions uh, about cartoons, search anything, you're welcome to come. We have uh, five minutes for questions. Anyone? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, you showed it the uh, pattern uh, that you create scope and then job and blah, blah, blah. Can it be abstracted away so I 
as a developer don't see this, I just put one something and, and this job and, and, and this uh, getter and setter is hidden from me because yeah. now it looks like uh, whenever I write my, my, my scope I need to put some boilerplate. Yeah, this, this one. one? This one? Yeah. yeah, usually, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, see, uh, whenever you write real application, you usually have uh, some particular architecture. For example, if you use MVP, then you know you have, uh, you don't just, because MV architecture is also kind of boilerplate. So, for example, let's take you have MVP, and you have a bunch of presenters for applications. Uh, you don't write like presenter from scratch. Usually you have some base presenter class that you inherit all your presenters from. So you do it once in your base presenter, and that's it. You do it only in type of application. You have one kind of usually lifecycle containing objects, and you implement this just once per application. So it's not a boilerplate. It's just part of your core library. And then whenever you create new presenter, uh, you don't have to remember about that. All your presenters automatically implement scope, and you can just launch cartoons from, from there. Now, if you're worried, for example, that, oh, I don't want my presenters to to the fact that they have a current scope be part of the public interface, you can also create a protected variable inside that is an instance of current scope called scope. And then instead of launch, you'll be saying scope.launch. And uh, in the release version of current library in 1.0, uh, like top level launch is now deprecated and will be removed in 1.0. So, so you will not be able to say launch without specifying the scope. That's, again, big difference from threats. In threats, you can change a threat, and that's it, launch it globally. With cartoons, we will be requiring that you always specify scope. So you're always structured. You always have to say what scope this cartoon belongs to. Yeah. Hi. Uh, an example with leaking uh, cartoons, you mentioned that if we will put uh, suspend function in cartoon scope and uh, one of them will crash, Coroutine scope will take care of it. Yes. But is there a way to report error from Coroutine to color code? Uh, yes, actually, the, when the, the exception, the, the crash exception actually gets aggregated by Coroutine scope and reported to whatever caller, so, and it will just flow through the call stack normally. So if one of my child, child it doesn't matter where it crashes, either in Coroutine scope or cell phone child, the, the, all the exceptions will get aggregated. So the first exception will be the root cause of your failure. And if, while shutting down the rest of your work, other exceptions are encountered, they will become suppressed exceptions to the root one. And then this root cause gets thrown outside. So whatever your error handling code that you have outside the quarantine score will catch it and will be able to report to logs or whatever. So, uh, and that's also good questions. Thank you. Uh, it's a very important difference between structured concurrency and the way you do threads. And then if you do structured concurrency, you never lose exceptions, never. There, you, it, there's never a case that thread crashed and just prints something to console. Nobody knows about it. With structured concurrency, exceptions are always, always percolate to the top and gets handled at the top. Then no exception gets ever lost. Thank you. Um, hi. Thanks for the talk. So I saw that we are sending a lot of uh, data back and forth between the coroutines. So how cheap actually is communication between coroutines? So uh, let me show our architectural picture, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, so we have a downloader, uh, and the architecture looks like this. We have lots of communication flowing back and forth. Uh, the, the cost of it really depends on what you're doing. So if you're doing like really cheap thing inside the worker, like adding t 2 plus 2, then it's definitely going to be very expensive uh, to send messages over channels because, uh, remember, channel is a, not just a communication primitive. Channel is a concurrent communication primitive. Um, channel can bridge coroutines around different contexts, you know, can talk to multiple. So channel is a concurrent communication. Concurrency is never cheap. Uh, so, but on the other side, if your workers do some real work, uh, like they go to backend system and download something, then channels are very cheap. You will not notice. You will not be able to measure the added, you know, performance impact of the channel if the work you do is some real work, like downloading something from a backend. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so my question is: Assuming I have a suspending function and I want to call launch or async or any other function that needs a, a scope as a as a receiver. Uh, I see two possibilities. I, need make my, I can make my suspending function an extension of uh, a coroutine scope, or I can call the coroutine scope top-level function. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, is there any difference between them, and when sh should I use which? You should so let, let me show you again. So whenever you want to launch uh, concurrent things from the uh, from the suspended function, sorry, there is also slides. Let me here it is. So whenever you want to launch uh, concurrent things from inside suspended function, you should use carotene scope primitive. That's that's is what designed for. It's a bridge between suspended functions and the functions that extend on the carotene scope. So by by carotene scope delimits structurally delimits all the concurrent work, all the children carotenes that you're launching. It won't complete until all the carotenes you launch are complete, so it makes sure you never leak any of the background task. You know, it, it waits until all the ch children complete and only then returns. So if you open some resources, files, network connections, and you have final sections to close them, you know, you are sure if you've used carotene scope that until, you know, it won't return until all those final sections complete. So, th so that's why you either write a suspended function or you write it as extension. You don't mix the two. So that current scope of the primitive use. OK, thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have that's the last question, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about uh, so how we can get the content back. So I see the communication internally inside the coroutines, but how we report the result of the work back to, let's say, UI thread or some. Uh, so, I mean, I've, yeah. the channels in the same way for communication from the coroutine back to? Sure. So let me, let me show you. So I've abstracted this part away. So I have some process content. I didn't show what it does, right? But assume you want to show it UI. So if you want to show it UI, you have two choices. You can either just access UI from there, because again, if your all coroutines are bound to the uh, your main thread, then they can simply go and touch UI right from this function. If you want to encapsulate it, if you want uh, this thing be, again, this depends on your architecture. If you want this thing like you're using some architecture and you want your business logic be abstracted away from UI so you can plug in different UIs, so you have this thing, this piece, then you also give it a channel where it report results to. And then it's very easy on your UI level to start a coroutine that receives from the channel updates UI. So, but they, then this thing is fully self-contained. It has an input channel and an output channel. You send it some work and receive over other channels result. And again, no shared mutable state. You never share any mutable state. You just send it, this subsystem some work and it, after some time, you know, reports you back results. And also, you can multiple uh, channels or like uh, multiple entry points inside the application that can access the content of this. I, the channel is a uh, multi sender, multi receiver abstraction. So, I mean, if you need to, you can send it from multiple places. And but when you receive, it works in fan out fashions. Uh, so, I mean, only one. There is also, if you go read documentation line, there's also broadcast channels. There's way more to this. I just my goal was to show you know basic things. If you're interested in more. Uh, now all the documentation lives on Cotton Link website in preparation 1.3 release. Go read it. There are m way more details on how this can be used and what primitives are there. And Thank the you very much. Channels are part of 1.3, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.